Well, as you uh, <clears throat> take out your notes this morning and find your place uh, in the Bible, if you have your Bible with you, you're going to be in Matthew chapter 7 today, and we'll have all the scripture on the screen behind me. Before I, I get started, I wanted to mention to you, I wanted to say thank you. Uh, this month, October, is Pastor Appreciation Month, and uh, you guys always go out of your way. You always do such a, a great job of, of letting myself and my family know uh, your appreciation for us and your love for us, and we really thank you for that. We appreciate it. And, and this month, incredibly, I've never seen this before, but uh, I guess if I understand correctly, uh, you guys divided up the month and each day of October uh, has been someone's day to say thank you to us. And uh, one of the interns told me that they thought that was pretty incredible since Jesus only gets one day a year, but somehow I get 31 days in October. And uh, so... I, I, it, I'll be honest with you, it's, it's pretty humbling, it's a little embarrassing at times, but it's much appreciated and, and already just so much love shown, and, and gosh, just thank you so much. And, and just to give you an example of some of the deep level of love I've been shown uh, over the past nine days, is this, I got in the mail to Brother Justin Ford, it says, uh, Potato Parcel is what it is called, and, and I got in the mail, in bubble wrap, a potato. It says, you are a spectacular pastor. I think this is gluten-free, not sure. Handle with caution your favorite church member. And then, of course, it's, it's anonymous, so I you know, don't know who it is. However, uh, just as the icing on the cake, uh, it does have a picture of me on the back of it from high school. No kidding, like with the polo glasses, you know from high school, don't know where that picture came from, suspecting Facebook, so if you notice my Facebook page gets taken down today, you'll know, you'll know why. But again, that's just the level of love that you guys as a church are able to demonstrate. Pretty incredible. Pretty incredible. All right, well, I hate to, uh, I hate to admit this, but I feel I should, I should probably let you know I have brought you here today under false pretenses. Okay? Because the topic that we're going to address today and over the next few weeks is a topic that for some of you, if you had known what it was, you would have made the decision to stay home today. That's right. But I didn't want you to stay home. I wanted you to be here to be a part of what we're going to discuss and learn. And so I didn't tell you about it until this moment right here. Now, some of you are frantically searching your notes to try to figure out what it is that the topic is today. The topic is this. The topic is the election that's coming up. The topic is what it means to be a Christian and an American. The topic is what would the Bible say to a presidential nominee? Now do you see why I kept you in the dark? Huh? <laughs> Well, obviously, politics is one of the topics that many people consider off-limits when it comes to the church. It's kind of like money, which is fairly ironic since when I finish this series in five weeks, we're going to be going right into our annual stewardship series. So, I guess I'll see everybody at Christmas, okay? Uh, but before you decide to check out of church until Christmas, let me tell you why I felt that I need to cover this topic. And let me tell you what it is that I want us to cover over the next month. First of all, I feel led to cover this topic. Because A, the political landscape leading up to this election feels about as divided and as unhealthy as it ever has felt in my lifetime. And because B, I believe that not only do we as Christians need America... I believe that America needs us as Christians. Now, I know that not everybody agrees with me about that, but I'll tell you who I believe would have agreed with me about that, and that is our founding fathers. The men who signed the Declaration of Independence. The men who wrote the Constitution of the United States. And while they were very, very careful not to establish a religion along with this new nation, they were also very careful not to leave a strong reliance on the protection of divine providence out of this new nation. 
They went out of their way to make sure that we were founded as a nation under God. And so I believe Christians and America need each other. I believe we benefit from each other. And that's why I think we need to talk about and think about and discuss how those two relationships, Christian and American, need to work together. Now, as to what I want to cover over the next five weeks, let me kind of start with what I'm not going to cover. And this is maybe the most important thing for you to hear. I am not in any way going to tell anyone who to vote for. You wouldn't listen to me if I did, but I'm not going to anyway, all right? I am not going to endorse or denigrate any spe specific political party or even any political point of view. Now, having said that, that does not mean I'm not going to offend you. Oh, I'm going to offend you, okay? But I'm going to be an equal opportunity offender, all right? I'm going to offend everybody equally just so nobody feels left out. I feel like that's my duty, all right? Now, here's what I am. That's what I'm not going to cover. Here's what I am going to cover. Over the next four weeks, I want to help give us a framework, some guardrails, if you will, for how we're going to approach the election that's coming up November 8th. Today, I want us to think about how we balance our faith and our politics. And I want us to think specifically about how we relate to people who disagree with us, politically, spiritually, or both. And then over the remaining four weeks, I want to take some wisdom that's actually found in God's Word that was given to political leaders, often unbelieving leaders, to see if we can't find a way to speak some of that wisdom into our modern day political environment. Okay? And the way that I want to do that is through what we're going to call letters to the next president. That we're going to compose each week as sort of a summary of what we learn from God's Word, from Scripture. And in a little bit, I'll explain how you can participate in that process as well. Now, understand something. I've never done anything like this, okay? I've never done a, a series. I've never come close to preaching a series like this. I am taking all kinds of risks to my credibility as a pastor. Maybe to my physical safety as a human being by the looks on some of your faces right now, okay? So I, I, here's what I need you to get. I am not asking you to sit there and be quiet and let me tell you what you need to know. I'm asking you to walk with me through this thing over the next month. Let's experiment together. Let's have a conversation together. Let's discover God's Word together. Because I'm convinced, I'm concerned about the direction of our nation. And I think that you are too. So, let's seek direction from God as it relates to this nation that we all love so much. And at the same time, let's see if God doesn't have some wisdom to speak in our, our own lives as well. Would you be willing to do that with me? All right. But before we, we start trying to give advice to the next president next week, let's spend today dealing with a couple of false assumptions about faith and politics. Let's start there. So if you've got your notes, let's begin with this. Here's assumption number one. Every Christian agrees on how faith and politics should interact with one another. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there are a couple of different approaches to the issue of faith and politics, and, and these may sound familiar to you as I give them because this is one of my favorite illustrations. I just usually use it in a different context. The first approach to faith and politics is what I call isolation. Write that word in, isolation. And the isolation approach to faith and politics says, faith and politics should have absolutely nothing to do with one another. Faith and politics should be completely isolated from each other. And so with the isolation approach, you would say, faith has no business impacting politics. And to be fair, politics has no business impacting faith. So, the right approach to faith and politics is not to allow one to influence the other. 
The other approach is infiltration. Is this starting to sound familiar to anybody? Okay. Uh, isolation and then infiltration. The infiltration approach to faith and politics says the exact opposite. That faith and politics are inseparable. That not only can faith impact politics as a Christian, we have a responsibility to make sure that faith infiltrates politics completely. So that there is no part of the political process that shouldn't be controlled and shaped and guided by our faith. Now here's what's interesting. When I describe the isolation approach to faith and politics, there are people sitting right here this morning thinking, that's right. That's right. That's exactly right. That's exactly what I believe. And by the way, that's exactly why you shouldn't be preaching it today. Amen? Right? And it's exactly why it bugs me every time you mention something political in a message or a Bible study. But when I mention the infiltration approach to faith and politics, there is another group who are sitting right here thinking, no, that is the right approach. Total infiltration of faith into politics is the way it should be. Really, it's our only hope as a nation. And, and you know what? If I'm being honest with you, Justin, it doesn't bug me when you mention something political in a sermon. It bugs me that you don't go far enough with what you say. Anybody want to say amen to that? So what we have here is two very different approaches to faith and to politics supported by two very different groups of people who are mostly convinced that their approach is the right approach and that everybody surely agrees with them. But here's the problem for Christians with both approaches. And it's just a small problem, okay? The problem is neither approach is biblical. It's just a little thing, okay? Now, neither approach is reflective of what we find in the Bible, either in the Old Testament or in the New. See, the isolation approach to faith and politics ignores the fact that in the Bible, God makes it very clear that every government on earth is within His control and available to be used by Him as He sees fit, whether they realize it or not. On the flip side, the infiltration approach to faith and politics ignores the fact that the kingdom of man, listen to me, will never bring redemption to this planet, no matter how hard they try. And so our citizenship in the kingdom of heaven comes way before our citizenship in the United States of America. And so while both approaches to faith and to politics are understandable, and I think they are well-intentioned, they are both ultimately flawed. But there is a third approach to faith and politics, and that is insulation. Insulation. Let me explain what I mean. Insulation, the insulation approach to faith and politics says that the responsibility of a Christian is to be involved in the political process, but not overcome by it. At the same time, Christianity itself has no business trying to overcome politics and shouldn't set itself up as some kind of redeemer of governments. Insulation means involved and influential, but not absolute and never, ever overcome. And by the way, I believe that this is actually what the writers of the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution intended when they wrote these words, that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. This is called the Establishment Clause. It's sometimes referred to as the separation of church and state, even though those words aren't actually in there. And I believe that what Thomas Jefferson and the other writers of the Constitution were trying to communicate here is the idea of insulation. Do you see that? Not isolation and not infiltration, but insulation. That faith can and should impact politics without overcoming it, without being overcome by it. Now, the reason I mention all of this 
goes back to the assumption everybody agrees on how faith and politics should interact with one another. All Christians are on the same page when it comes to this. I mean, obviously we don't agree on this as a nation. In fact, I'm, I'm not sure that we've ever been more divided as a nation in terms of this. But a lot of people believe that obviously we're going to be able to agree on this as a church. Surely, right? I mean, surely right here at, at Oakdale we all feel the same way about faith and politics. It's very clear to me which approach is, is correct when it comes to faith and politics. And obviously everybody's going to see it the same way I do. But that is just not the case. And so over the next four weeks, as we go to Scripture and study these stories of godly men who gave godly advice to kings and pharaohs and rulers, and then as we try to apply that wisdom to our current political candidates, what's going to happen is you're going you're to go to that process and, and what, you're going to hear what I say through the lens of your political views. In other words, if you're a Republican, you're going to interpret the warnings as, you Democrats better listen up. And if you're a Democrat, you're going to interpret the challenges as, you know, you Republicans have got it all wrong. And both sides will assume that everyone agrees with you. But I want to caution you not to do that. I want you to remember that God never picked a political party or a political system to favor. Instead, He said all governments are made up of men and all men are flawed. And ultimately, my will is going to be done regardless of what men do. But, but, he also said this. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Amen? And so as we approach these next four weeks with letters of advice and wisdom to our next president, whoever he or she may be, Let's not be fooled by the false assumption that every Christian agrees on how faith and politics should interact with one another. And then here is our second false assumption about faith and politics. Are you ready for this? The assumption is politicians are to blame for the condition of our political system. Now, you may say, well... <laughs> Hold on a second. Of course politicians are to blame. I mean, who else would we blame? Politicians are all a bunch of no good, money grubbing, power hungry. Jim, am I forgetting any adjectives? Uh, sheep, you know, wolves in sheep clo sheep's clothing, right? I mean, of course politicians are to blame. I, I, I mean, it's certainly not us, right? We all love our country. We want the best for our country. We just can't find candidates who reflect our values. That's, that's our problem. Clearly, it's the politicians' fault. Well, there is plenty of blame to go around for politicians in our system who have taken advantage, whose motives have been self-serving, and who have made our system something I don't believe it was ever intended to be. But before we draw that conclusion, before we wag our crooked finger in the face you know, of our two political candidates, in fact, when we showed those two pictures up there, I can kind of hear this inaudible groan. Okay? Before we decide to do that, and before we proclaim what I've heard many, many, many people proclaiming this year, is this the best we could come up with? In fact, how many of you have said those very words at some point this year? Okay, alright. Before we do that and just walk away, let's take a look at something Jesus said about that very kind of attitude that I believe applies perfectly in this situation. You're not going to like it, but I think it applies perfectly. This is Matthew 7. We begin in verse 3. You're going to love this. <clears throat> Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. 
First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, if I didn't offend everyone in the first part of the message, surely I've covered everyone now, right? All right, listen, just, everybody just take a deep breath, and, and let's just think through this together. First of all, Jesus says, when you come to a place of judgment, when you come to a place when you are ready to blame someone else for the situation at hand, you need to realize two things. Number one, there's usually enough blame to go around for everyone, yes? And number two, the only reason you think it's someone else's fault is because you are blinded by your own sin. And I don't know about you, but as I read this, this feels kind of like a blanket statement. This feels like something that applies not just in certain situations, but rather to the human experience. Then Jesus says that anyone who does that, anyone who places blame without first considering that they may have played a part in it, is a hypocrite. Which, of course, is incredibly offensive. I mean, I didn't vote these people into office. I'm not the one serving on Capitol Hill. How can I have any blame in any of this? Well, let me ask you a question. Do you know what the single largest voting block in the United States is? Just think about all the, the different constituencies. Think about it. What is the largest voting block in the United States? It, it, it's not men, okay? It's not women. It's about 50-50 split, but it's not one of those. It's not a political party. It's not an age group. It's not any kind of special interest group. It's not the military. It's not unions. It's not a socioeconomic class. It's not even a race. Do you know what the single largest voting bloc in the United States is now and has been since the birth of this nation? It's Christians. Seventy-six percent of citizens in 2016 identify themselves as Christians. And do you know what that means? Listen to me. It means that we determine who sits in the Oval Office. We determine who serves on Capitol Hill. And we are responsible for the condition of the political system in the United States of America. And as upset as we may be about the way things are going in Washington, D.C., and as angry as it makes us that our government can't seem to get it right, and as fearful as we may be about what could happen next, no matter who becomes the next president, it doesn't do any good for us to point our finger at politicians without recognizing our own responsibility in the situation. Now, that's the bad news, but there is some good news. I want you to notice the third word in verse 5. First. First. Do you know what that word means? It means there is an alternative. It means there is hope. He says, you want to know what to do to get yourself out of the situation you've put yourself in? You want to know how you can make America great again? You want to know how you can become stronger together? First. He says, first, take the plank out of your own eye. And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus says, do you want to see clearly? Do you want to be realistic about how we've gotten to this place as a nation? Then here's an idea. Go home and look in the mirror. Before you point a finger, before you assume someone else is to blame Christians, take a look at yourself and recognize your role in all of this. Because here's the reality. Before you can impact politicians, before you can impact Washington, D.C., before you can change the political environment that has gotten so unhealthy, you've got to change you. That's what has to happen. It starts with you, Christians. It starts with you, churches. It starts with you, 
Oakdale. It starts with you, family. It starts with you. It starts with you. Now, you may say, well, Justin, who are you? <laughs> To stand up there, you know, with all that self-righteousness and point at us and blame us and tell us what we need to do. Well, Hillary Clinton's slogan is, I'm with her, right? Mine is, I'm with you, okay? I'm with you. I'm in the exact same boat. I'm counting myself right alongside of you as a dual citizen of the kingdom of heaven on one hand and the United States of America on the other. I am a Christian with the same rights, the same responsibilities, and the same potential for influence as you. And like you, I have to take a hard look in the mirror before I can hope to point out other people's flaws and weaknesses and shortcomings. Before I can search God's Word for wisdom that would be helpful to the next president, as we're going to do over these next four weeks. We're all in this boat together. The bad news is I share responsibility for the holes that are causing us to take on water. The good news is if I'm willing to be honest with myself, there is still the potential for great blessings and great clarity and I believe even a new direction for our nation. The question is, will you join me on this journey? So, here's what I want to invite you to do. Starting today, you can begin composing your own letters to the next president, whoever it may be. Write them, you know, write in them whatever you would like to do. Some of you have so much anger and bitterness built up, you just need to get it out somehow, okay? So, I'll be your sounding board over the next few weeks. You write your letter. You send it by email to, to my email address right there. Write that down if you need to. It's also on the website. And I will use what you write as I compose our letters to the next president each week over the next month leading up to the election. That's why we're going to do it. Okay? Now, here's our, first, here's our first letter. Are you ready? Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Here it is. Dear Mr. or Mrs. President, we want to congratulate you on your victory in the election and let you know that we will be praying for you as, we, as you prepare to take office. However, we have to warn you that because of our concerns over the condition of our nation, it is with great apprehension that Christians prepare for your upcoming presidential term. In many ways, we are fearful of the direction our country is headed. We are leery of politicians who only seem interested in protecting their own power and importance. And we are discouraged by the divisiveness we observe in our country every day. Today, however, as Christians, we want to acknowledge our role in the condition of our political system. We recognize today that as Christians, we have and have always had the greatest ability of any constituency to influence our country in whatever ways we choose. And to blame you or any other politician elected by us is nothing more than the height of hypocrisy. Therefore, our commitment to you is that in the coming years of your presidency, before we offer any criticism or judgment, we will take a hard look in the mirror at our own motives, attitudes, and actions. And we will ask God to show us how we can improve as citizens both of the kingdom of God and of this great country we love so much. And as we relearn how to take responsibility for the condition of our country, we pray that God will help give us clarity on what it means to be a nation whose God is Lord. Why don't you pray with me?
Heavenly Father, this is a combustible topic. I know you know that. I also know that you are in control. But God, in so many ways, there is so much divisiveness and so much disagreement and so much healthiness when it comes to the, the conversation that goes with this. And yet, Father, I believe that there is something important for us to learn here. God, on one hand, we have got to understand that, that we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven first. And that that is the most important thing in our life. But I also believe, God, that you would have us be Christians in every area of our life, including politics. And so, God, before we go to your word, and I look forward to that opportunity to find out some of the wisdom, some of the advice, some of the principles given by godly men to ungodly leaders, before we do that, I recognize that it is important that we look in the mirror at ourselves and that we understand our role in where we are as a nation. That we don't just simply cast blame as if we've got no responsibility. Now God, that is hard to do. It is hard for us to look in the mirror. It's hard for us to see this in the mirror. But I believe that is exactly what you would have us to do. And so this morning, I pray that our hearts might be humbled, that our hearts might be set right, so that in the weeks to come, we might be able to faithfully extract from your word the principles that we need to understand. Now God, as we enter into this time of reflection, of response to you, I pray that you would speak to our heart. I pray that we would begin even now to humble ourselves, to desire more of you in our life, in our family, in our church, in our community, in our nation. But God, it starts with us as individuals. It starts with us as families. It starts with us as a church. May we adjust to your will today. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Before I have you stand, I just want to ask you, are you willing to engage in this? Are you willing to consider what God may be saying to you? You may be really pumped up and ready to go right now. Are you willing to be considerate of others who feel differently? You may be really angry right now. Would you be open to what maybe God wants to say to you in the weeks to come? Every single one of us, no matter how young or how old, we have to choose to open our hearts to our Heavenly Father. So that's what I want to challenge you to do today. As Jamie leads us, we're going to stand in just a moment. We're going to sing. We're going to let the words that we sing reflect on our heart. We're going to consider God's Word that we've read. And we're going to listen to His voice to show us how He wants us to respond. That's my challenge to you.